be in the world. Well, today we have a person born in Egypt, living in the UK, so I understand, uh, And uh, but there's much more to him than just that, okay? Dr. Hani Albana is with us. Uh, thank you for your time, and great you. to have you, well, in your company, in this case, two successive days, so I'm pretty on it. Thank you. And assalamu alaikum to you. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Now, I'm looking at the things you do, right? Um, chairperson of the Muslim Charities Forum, uh, president of the Humanitarian Forum, uh, founder, co-founder of, of Islamic Relief, and that's Islamic Relief Worldwide. Uh, am I missing out on other things as well? Because I think there's like yeah. 10 other things, but amongst the key things. I think that's enough. I think let us focus on the discussion of today about the charity work, about the humanitarian response, about the need for us to respond heavily to what's happening in the world. Mm. Why, why are you here in South Africa, in Ramadan? I came to South Africa in Ramadan to visit the stricken area in Malawi and Mozambique about uh, the cyclone, the last cyclone, to see them and to learn a lot from the needs of the people, to learn it from the small organization in South Africa and Malawi and Mozambique and to have a new vision of how to go forward uh, especially in Africa, of having big uh, hit by a cyclone like this, affecting uh, very poor areas. And, and usually, sir, because it, it's not common, right? Yes, and twice in one month or two months mm. in, in Mozambique as well. That's why I'm here, to learn more than actually to give something out. Okay, and have you been to those areas? or you still Tomorrow, going? tomorrow I'm going to Malawi. And next week, I'm going to Mozambique, inshallah. Okay. T tell me, therefore, I mean, and, and when you say you want to learn, would that be part of the Muslim Charities Forum on, on behalf of them or? or it's uh, Muslim Charities Forum is an umbrella of Muslim Charities in UK, about 17 organization being built 11 years ago to try to coordinate and uh, collaborate between the organization, and create big partnership between both of them and increase the capacity of the local small organization in UK. The second organization called the Humanitarian Forum, which is a bridge between international organization globally. When you bring people together in one platform to empower especially the small grown organization mm. from the south, especially. This is the second organization. So I'm here on behalf of both of them. Plus, on personal capacity, I want to learn. Because the more you learn, the more you'll be able to deliver a message, the more you'll be able to find a solution, the more you'll be able to motivate different community in different parts of the world. So what, what, what's the great insight, therefore, in advance uh, when it comes to relief organizations, uh, humanitarian organizations like the ones you're involved in, being able to provide support to, you know, drought-stricken areas, uh, cyclone-stricken areas, flooding, earthquakes, whatever. I mean, is, is there a key formula that says this is the way we do it that will work? You see, the most important thing you can take away from this response is a smile on the face of a child or a handshake mm -hmm. from an old man or uh, a nodding from a head of the old woman which telling you thank you. It's very important to be with the people at the time they need you, not at the time you need them. You see, it's very important to stand next to them. And this is what makes the difference. What makes the difference is to be there, to be available, to be listening, to be amongst them. So uh, this is what makes the difference between work is a mission is not just a job a job is a part of the mission humanitarian work is a message to be delivered not only to the poor people who are the owner of the money that you spend on them but really a message to humanity and the message which is the part of the message of Islam so Islam is a universal message where the Prophet ﷺ was talking to everyone, anyone, everywhere, anywhere, even talking about animals, birds, habitats, climate, and all these sort of things. And humanitarian work is a part of Islam as a message, is a part of Islam as a mission, is a part of Islam as a product that you have to deliver to the community that you claim that you are serving. Mm -hmm. This is the dimension of the MTN work that we would like to let the young people, 
before coming to this field of work to understand the dimension and the mechanics of such a dimension which can build their character before coming and after they come. Okay. Somebody, somebody listening in may be saying, I think I know what charity is, but, but what is humanitarian work? So, so what's the one-line description? Humanitarian of, work, of as is humanity? defined by the, by the West, is a relief response. See, to stand next to the people at the time of disaster. When the disaster is over, you go to rehabilitation and you go to development mm -hmm. and you go to a long-term program. Humanitarian work is the quickest response to the people in need at the time of, of need where they are. Mm -hmm. Like if in tsunami, I remember it was happening, I can't remember, 24th or 25th. The well, first Christmas day, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Boxing day. The yeah, next day, and yeah. actually the first team from uh, Indonesia in Banda Aceh was on 26th. We were there on 28, 29, traveling from UK to go to Banda Aceh at that time. This is where the people want to see you. Your material response, a part of it is the human feeling in your heart towards them when they are in a state of shock. If they are in a state of shock and they are say, they even say, shaking the hand without having anything mm -hmm. to give, this is a feeling to lift them up. You made the point earlier that that the... The results of humanitarian work is exactly that, the girl smiling or the old man coming That's to, it. to shake More, your hands. Yeah. I, I take it uh, yourself, Dr. Hani al Banna, you've, you've encountered that on many occasions, the little girl smiling and the man. Alhamdulillah, yes. You, yeah? Yeah, that, that's actually when, when, when we go to different parts of the world and we don't know even to speak the language. We can speak the animal language. We can make some songs to them, to let them. What, what you need to be, to be doing as a humanitarian worker is to draw a smile in the hearts, not on the face of the people. When people smile from their hearts, their body will be feeling the power that they can go forward in their agony, in their, in, in, in their struggle, in their difficult life. So here is the challenge. And if your communication with them go through your heart it will go to their heart to draw an, a, a never-ending smile on their faces because it comes from their hearts mm. and this is where the people who don't understand your language the people who don't understand your culture the people who don't understand you their hearts it's open for you because they trust your mission. Because your mission is for them, not for yourself. And, and do you find, therefore, that in just about all cases with these responses that you make, that these communities or countries affected by it, there's a sense of utter hopelessness or, or helplessness? Or, in fact, is it helpless, but there is hope? It is helpless, and some, some, sometimes they lost hope. You know why? Because they lost everything. Like when you look now at the last influx of displaced people from Idlib and Syria, mm. three, four hundred thousand came out after the bombing. They are s sitting under the trees, have nothing with them apart from what they carried with them when they left home. This moment is the moment of helplessness. Losing hope is the moment when you have to be there with them. Even if you don't have anything in your hand, but being there makes life different for them and wow. change the state of hopelessness into being hopeful well, and they I, can fight back. I certainly want to find out later on how, how did you get involved in that in the first place. My guest in the Champion People feature is Dr. Haniel Banner. Uh, he's, uh, well, amongst many titles, chairperson, Muslim Charities Forum, uh, UK-based, that is, uh, and then also president of the executive of the, of the trust, that is, of the Humanitarian Forum, as well as a co-founder of Islamic Relief, which I think would be certainly well known to you uh, because it's, it's, it's a... It's an organization that you should be familiar with. Lots to engage with. By the way, if you want to call in and engage, not me, but engage him, well, here's your chance. Otherwise, the opportunity will go away. So here's the numbers to call in. 011-680-0355 if you're doing it through Johannesburg. For Cape Town, it's 021-442-3530. Uh, voice notes are welcome. It's 083-709-2083. You can also listen in on uh, Facebook Live on Salah Media as Instagram Live as well. But if you want to listen via an app besides online, just go to tune in and you'll find us there. Lots to talk about there. So interestingly enough, you made the point that 
it's providing a relief response. It's always a response, right? Yeah. Humanitarian work is not proactive. I mean, there are people in other parts of the world in this country that do proactive nation building, community building. That's not humanitarian work. This comes, you can do it while you are doing humanitarian response in an area which is settled, okay, or you can do it sooner after the humanitarian response is over, mm -hmm. when you can build a community. There's different mechanics between humanitarian response and community building. Community building is a long-term program, not projects, because quite often mm, people mm. think that they've done a project of development. Pro development is a program. Program made out of different projects, water, sanitation, Absolutely. health, and all this collectiveness. If we go to a village and we're saying that we need to develop this village over the coming 10 years, okay? So what do we need? We need schooling, we need the local market, we need the community center, we need sanitation, we need uh, a clinic, we need uh, uh, schools and all these kind of things. So collectively, over the coming five or ten years, you make a program of development or development program to change the whole area, actually, by providing water, sanitation, all the, and this is the development program. Inside the program itself, there's many projects you can do. Mm. Project is not just something somebody jump on a bandwagon mm, mm, and mm. go and take a photograph and said, hey, well, I've got 10,000 <laughs> projects. Each project lasts for six months or one month or two months. This is a joke. This is the jokers who actually sometimes, sometimes infest the humanitarian work and the development work and the advocacy. What we need nowadays, uh, Brother Ashraf, is not only development. We need to talk about advocacy, we need to talk about research, we need to talk about think tank, we need to talk about building youth leadership. We need to talk about building local community and empowering the local community and making them to be a part of the international Absolutely. community. Absolutely, I think all these are important. Well, what do you say to the critics that say, if there's a problem in, in South Africa, Allah forbid, yeah. if there's a problem in Mozambique, which is very much our neighbor, or Botswana, or... or, or uh, uh, Malawi or wherever it may be in the world, Haiti, uh, Indonesia, wherever. Really, we have enough problems of our own. Let those countries sort it out themselves. What, what do you say to someone who tells you that? What will happen when it comes to you at home and people don't help you? It's the same. My duty as a humanitarian worker is to be responsive and responsible. Responsible for whatever I can. I don't say that I'm going to solve a big problem. But I can do my share because Allah says that Allah is asking you to do what you can, as I said earlier on, even being with the people there, even with sending a message. But, but is it fair to say that in many, not one or two, I'm saying in maybe 40, 50 countries of the world, when there's a major disaster, those countries will not be able to cope if they don't get Definitely. If they don't get support. Definitely. 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 That's why we need and not what what we need is to build problem happen in this area the first team from the collective of the organization have the first hundred thousand dollar but by the end of one, the first or second or third week we could spend the million or the two million the three million when our community feels that we are united they give more money they give more money to the collective because they feel that unity is the answer for for actually responding mm, mm, to mm. the different big disasters whether in syria or nobody can claim that they can do the work for yemen in one village in yemen in one village in syria in one village in south sudan in one village in the democratic republic yeah, of congo yeah, yeah. in one village in uh, central africa you know in central african Republic, as we were discussing it earlier there's ethnic cleansing on a daily basis few hundred thousand Muslims have already left to Chad and other countries. Why? Because of this ethnic cleansing. And nobody's talking about it. We need to talk about it. Absolutely. Is your, is your efforts, uh, specifically Dr. Dr. Albana, uh, is it Muslim orientated? No, I, I no, understand no. the inspiration, but, yeah. but do you go to Muslim places? No, uh, no. You mentioned the DRC, which is not, I know. Right? Yeah. No, not at all, actually. You see, because Islam is not for the Muslims. Islam is for the humanity. Islam as a universal message taught us to look after our next door neighbor, even to the fifth or the sixth or the sixties 
a neighbor next to us without saying, Prophet Sallallahu without saying whether he is a Muslim or not mm-hmm. a Muslim. When there is a need, there is no distinction. No distinction whatsoever. And you, in practical terms, you play that out. I believe in it. If I, if, 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 if I don't have the means, I believe in it. So I understand for Allah telling him, you created those people and this is my responsibility as a Muslim. If I don't have the means, but I have the message. That actually when we do work for humanity, we have to remove all the barriers, to cross all mm. the borders because the need is for the needy. And the needy, you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Ma'un, Allah said in this surah, if you look at the scale, one side and one side, those people who do not treat orphan without mentioning is the orphan Muslim or Muslim, who treat them badly, are like the people who deny the religion. The day of judgment. Okay, it's not only important. Those yeah. people who do not advocate for the need of the needy. The day of judgment. He never said this is the Muslims or this is the team. This is very heavy to all of us. We have to cross all the to reach the needy because the Prophet Sallallahu when he said, Oh Allah. Make me among the miskin. He never said Muslim miskin or non-Muslim miskin. That among the miskin, as a whole. Yeah. How? Let, let's take with the organisations that that you involved in. I mean, how much? First of all, is are our organisations in competition with each other? Because you know you it speak about there. coming together. So they do good. Everybody does good. But yeah. but are they competing to be the best and better than the other? And, and they in their own little league, if I can call it that. There is no harm of competing, mm-hmm. but was when you compete, you can coordinate as well. Your market share could be fifty percent. My market share could be five percent. But one day I might have the most innovative idea, which can give me the fifty percent to what you have. So at the end of the day, if you want to become bigger and to grow bigger, you have to allow the smaller organization to grow as well, to let them to stand next to yourself. And yani fatherhood in the in in the, in the humanitarian sector must be there when the big organization mm. take the small organization by the hand, not to cut their throat. This is very very important. That's why coordination meeting, collaboration meeting is very important. To so keep how it, how successful have you been? I mean, you you, I, I know you you you're a prime founder of um, of Islamic Relief, but I mean that's not your your beat at the moment, right? Yes. You spend most of your time uh, with the with the other forums, so. With the Muslim charities forum in the UK, for example, are you successful in getting them to understand exactly what you just said? We are partially successful. Successful. I have to be very honest, because changing the mindset is more difficult than actually planting a tree, mm. than actually building a road or building a building. Working in the mind and in the heart takes years. But Alhamdulillah, it is it is being taken seriously. By a lot of organizations, we have 17 of them now in Muslim Child's Forum, but we need them to become 70 or 80 or 90 or 100. Inshallah. There's a lot of hard work. Other thing is actually Muslim donors or even non-Muslim donors do not give money to this kind of activities. They can give you money for disasters, mm-hmm. for a cyclone, for flood, for uh, victims of uh, conflict and on so on. So. But when it comes to them workshop. When it comes to them, capacity building, when it comes to them, uh, research and advocacy, oh, what is this? Why, why not? Do they not get it? This is the level of awareness which actually we need to raise the donors to have it. To be very honest, Allah said in the Surah Ma'un, Had. The word Had is absolute advocacy. Okay. Well, Allah, absolute advocacy. And now we don't invest in advocacy. Yeah. Well, there you are. Lots of important insights coming out of this with my guest, Dr. Hani Albana, born in, in, in Egypt, living in the UK, I understand. Uh, but uh, it also has got an OBE. I'll find out why did he get that OBE in a moment. O double one six eight oh three double five uh from uh Joburg Salam Media listeners, otherwise O two one double four two three five three zero if you wish to connect with us via Voice of the K. But otherwise I know many people watching us on Facebook Live as well. So thumbs up to you for watching and you can actually comment right away even when we're there. I want to find out, in fact, where did it all start for a person who, in fact, is a medical doctor? We'll get to that in a moment.
Talking to Dr. Hani Albana, Salaamu Alaikum. Great that you engaging with us as a, as a listener or a viewer. And you can watch us uh, via Salaam Media, Facebook Live, Instagram Live, uh, as well as Voice of the Cape directly on radio. If you're listening, thumbs up. Glad that you're doing just that as well. Uh, and also via the uh, app that is on from Salaam Media, which is go to the Tune In app and you'll find us. 011-680-0355, Johannesburg, Cape Town, 021 Double four two three five three zero and the WhatsApp voice note 0837092083. Now I made the point you're doing impressive work. Uh, you're a medical doctor. I was. Goodness, like nobody gives it up. So, so do you actually say I was? Like you, I do. I do. I was. <laughs> All right. You better tell us the story. So, what happened to you from the beginning? Because I understand there's a fascinating story between your choice of career, between your views, your your mother's view, and your father's view. What happened? How's it? <laughs> <laughs> My father wants me to be a sheikh, alim, because nice. he was alim, rahmatullahi. And my mother wants me to be a doctor, a medical doctor. So I went through my mother's tunnel. Of course, every <laughs> child go follow the mother, not follow the father. So, so I came to UK uh, to do my medical degree, alhamdulillah. And from, I, from Egypt, right? Yeah. From Egypt, yeah. Okay. From, I'm qualified from Azhar University Medical right. School. And I never thought that we'll do Islamic relief or we'll start Islamic relief. My objective was to have a degree and go back to Egypt, open clinic, and this is the end of the story. But I feel that Allah gave me my degree, which is Doctor of Medicine, MD, because of Islamic relief. So it was a crossroad between education, career, medical career, and humanitarian response. 1983 was a turning point 
with the with the, with the famine in Eritrea and Tigray, mm-hmm. was a part of Ethiopia at that okay, time. Okay, one of one of Africa, yeah. And at that time, we found mm-hmm. that Muslims in the country doing nothing. In in those regions, predominantly in, in, Muslim regions, it's right? Especially yeah. in UK, okay. all the response for the non-Muslims. That's why the idea came after visiting Sudan and seeing some of the refugees to do something. So why, why did you visit? Because I mean, you you're the medical but, doctor. Yeah, you went the, on, a, on a medical. There so, was a what? medical meeting there, okay. and they went right. to attend it. And at the same time, one of the uh, people working in in an organization there took us by the hand, and we saw. This kind of we started very in a very humble and simple, very simple. But wait, that that visit then from Sudan, Eritrea, that changed your life in effect. Definitely, yeah, definitely. I went back to my family in uh, um, end of Christmas, beginning of uh, I think uh, the January first or second of January, nineteen eighty four, to show my family, my mother, my relatives, the images, and there is about fifteen hundred Egyptian pound with twenty pence from my young boy at the age of nine. What is this? Was his chocolate money? This was the first donation to start mm, at mm, the first mm. seat for Islamic League. Then from there, we we'll make some khutbah in Islamic University, uh, in Islamic uh, in Islamic society in the yeah, uh, Islamic society in Birmingham University and Aston University, and we raise about another a few hundred pound. We open a bank account. That's it, and then we went from door to door. Dri- driven by what the need. That driven by the needs. Something. Driven by the needs. The only thing at that time we're focusing on the needs of the people who came out. Okay, but let me ask you this then before we, we continue. So, you're a medical doctor. I know what your mother and father said, fine. But you go to Sudan and you go to visiting the neighbors and you see what happened in Eritrea and, and you're obviously shocked by that, I understand, right? Yeah. But, but shock is one thing. Yeah. How does that transfer? And this is where you find most of the prophets, all the prophets have got this kind of responsibility which you cannot measure. And you cannot actually draw the dimension of the responsibility. Mm-hmm. It's so heavy when you see skinny people, skinny people and dying people in agony. And he say, what I'm doing? And this shift you. Once you shift one angle to one, actually five degree or 10 degree, it will keep you, it will take you to the right direction. And this is what happened exactly. The, the, the very, very strong images came out from the refugees camp at the time. Make this shift my, okay. in the mindset. So it changed, the heart. It changed you. Definitely. Right? Yeah. Okay. Then you decided with you and who? With me and, and uh, w- w- when I came uh, to UK, it was a, 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 a Iraqi Palestinian brother, Dr. Ihsan, was doing his PhD in chemistry. Mm-hmm. And he said, yes, I'll be with you. Only two people. Okay. No office. No plan, no budget, no facilities, no VIP, nothing. And they were going from door to door, from shop to shop, from mosque to mosque, from street to street, from function to function, mm. to raise funds for Africa. And with these donation boxes at that time. Every Tuesday, or no, every th- uh, Saturday, we used to go and open the donation box. Mm-hmm. The first headquarter of the organization was a donation box, costing us 16 pounds at that time. We opened used to open it every Saturday and take the checks. Five pound ten pound. In August nineteen eighty four was the, the the biggest donation which came to us, which was one thousand pound from a, 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 a doctor originally from Libya. I was working in UK to the people in Africa. And we made a party. Oh mm. one thousand pounds. Narai Takbir. And you see and this made us made, made our journey after eight months of hard work of walking from door to door. You see, this is very important. Never put the resources as a challenge. You or challenge the, or the lack of resources. The lack, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, the lack mm. of resources as a challenge. Mm. Mm. The, your challenge is to make resources. Your challenge is to drive your vision. Your challenge is. To, make, to translate your vision into a product, a tangible product that the community can follow you. Your challenge is not to follow the flow as a leader, but to make the people to follow the flow you make for them. Did you, always, did you always feel that way? You know, never let the lack of resources yeah. limit your, your goals? 
No, I never because I left a multi-million pound organization to a 200,000 pound organization and they still 200,000 pound and they cannot raise the 200,000 pound yeah. and we struggle to raise them. You see, this is the challenge for 11 years. The budget is about 150, 200,000 pound. We struggle to raise it, but because there's a need, sometimes the community might not see what you see, Brother Ashraf, but mm. because of the need to start to keep planting this tree, our 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 aim is to change the tree into a forest. So you made the point that, or oh, claim that, Islamic Relief. So that's the organization that you founded, right, with your with your Iraqi uh, Palestinian colleague, uh, then grew into what the the largest uh, Islamic humanitarian organization, what in the world or in the Western world? In the world. My my guest, Dr. Hani El Banna. We've got five minutes uh, more with him, chairperson of the Muslim uh, Charities Forum and also president of the Humanitarian Forum. I wish I could ask him so many more things about things in Egypt and, and the Middle East. We'll see if we can get there in the, in the remaining minutes. Uh, the question I want to ask you, so you mentioned some numbers. Just repeat that number again in terms of uh, the Islamic uh, relief. Just what budget did that hold? It could be up to 300. 300 million, million. U US dollars? US dollars. Oh, okay, US dollars. How did the capacity grow from the two medical people walking uh, on the high street in London uh, with mm -hmm. your little box to where it is now? What, 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 what's the lesson? How did that happen? We were focusing at that time in the 80s on the rich countries to start the fundraising offices first such as America, such as Sweden, such as Germany, France, uh, Italy, UK, and the others. Mm -hmm. This will stabilize your income. We did not rely on non-European or non-American countries at the very beginning, at that time. Mm -hmm. After that, we start to grow yani, slowly in the south, like Sudan, Pakistan, and all the other problems. But when we made the balance between the two, Actually, mm -hmm. we managed to mm -hmm. raise the fund through the rich communities in different pa in parts of, of the rich countries, as that I mentioned. This is what made us, mm -hmm. uh, what made Islamic League actually to be successful up till now. 
we were created at the time when the political atmosphere was not as bad as it was we see nowadays. The division among the Muslims was not as bad as we can see nowadays. The Islamophobia and the counter-extremism mm. and counter we, uh, we, we, we have nowadays. But we managed to succeed excellently at the time of September 11, when we decided uh, uh, courageously not to put our head down, but to stand up and to defend the community globally and say, hey, we are, we are not going to shy from the media. We're going to go to the media, to talk to the media, to head back to the media and to show them the distinction between us as a humanitarian organization and the people who dip their, their, their head down. And that worked. And it did work very well. So at a time of disaster, you have to be clear and clean and vocal. Actually, I'm building this kind of uh, partnership coalition between others. Gates, 10 years. September the 11th, came. everybody knew us. From the United Nations, from the European mm. Union, from the politicians. Eyebrows about us. What's your, what's your message to, to, we got two. What's your message? In efforts in. We have to invest in our country in South Africa. Build the capacity of the organization build the capacity of our youth, connect with the, with the greater non-Muslim community and society, show them the beauty of our culture, the beauty of our religion, the beauty of our values. Don't live in ghettos anymore. No ghettos anymore. Mm -hmm. Ghettos will make us live in a suicidal area or in an area that anybody can come and remove us or alienate us from, from, from the country. It's the time that we will have to invest in women, in youth, in community building, and bridge building with our organization in and, our country. And quickly, how, how, in 30 seconds, how, how significant is Muslim relief, not Islamic, Muslim relief amongst all the Muslim organizations uh, when it comes to relief work in the world compared to, to those who are not Muslim? They could be the first, but nobody will know about them. Because Why? they don't use media. Did actually shy from using media, shy from communicating and connecting, shy from coming to the international community and being a part of United Nations, a part of European Union, a part of all these big establishments. We have to know the art how to connect and be a part of the different. Right, here's systems. the last thing. What about giving charity with your with your one hand and, and covering it with the this other? Organization money. My organization money has to be public and everybody should know it. And I should be accountable to every penny that I spend, whether actually I spend it rightly or wrongly, because I'm accountable to community, accountable to government, accountable to donor, accountable also to the poor people that I claim that I'm their champion. Of course, I will say he got an OBE for his work with Islamic Relief. So here's the last thing as we get to news. I made the point about moving South Africa from a mid-table nation to a, to a champion nation, champion South Africa. What's the one thing we need to do as a country to get there? Invest in human resources, invest in youth, invest in technology and education. Education is the cornerstone of advancement of any country on earth. Not the traditional education, the education with the education in different aspects of life. Absolutely. That's where we're going to leave it. Good chatting to you. I will chat to you wherever you are in the world because there's many other things I want to pick your brain on, but not today. Certainly one of our champion people in the world, I would say, Dr. Hani uh, Albana, the chairperson of the Muslim Charities Forum, founder of Islamic Relief. Thank you for honoring us with your Thank visit. You. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let's get the news now and we join Voice of the Cape.